All right, we left off here on uh, this lecture called From Pentecost to Patmos, talking about the apostolic church. And this much of this church history corresponds with what we find in the book of Acts, since the book of Acts is a Holy Spirit-inspired account of the first 30 years of church history. Luke, of course, is the writer of the book of Acts, and he wrote Acts as a sequel to his gospel, the gospel according to Luke. So we have Luke's gospel, which covers roughly 30 years of time. The gospel does, if we start with the birth of Christ all the way through to the crucifixion, a little bit more than 30 years, but it really concentrates on the final three and a half years of Christ's earthly ministry, his public ministry. And then the book of Acts opens with the day of Pentecost, and it also, the book of Acts, covers 30 years of time, starting in 30 AD with the day of Pentecost, and then ending in Rome with Paul's house arrest, his first imprisonment in Rome. And the book of Acts ends right around 60 AD, covers that 30-year period of time. The first eight chapters of the book of Acts focuses in on the first two years of church history, from 30 to 32 or so. Chapter 9 gives us the conversion of Saul, and from there Luke's account picks up more quickly as we transition in the book from focusing on Peter and really the spread of the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to then Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, and the spread of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire on Paul's three missionary journeys, which are recorded in Acts. And we believe Paul took a fourth missionary journey, which is not recorded in the book of Acts, but took place after his first Roman imprisonment. And we'll get to that in a little bit. We spent some time on Thursday looking at Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And one thing I want to note about the events of Acts chapter 2 and really the entire account of Acts, it's the Acts of the Apostles is what this book has been titled, but it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit as he worked through the Apostles to establish the church. One thing we need to note about the book of Acts is that the book of Acts represents a transition period in God's working in salvation history. And as a result, there are some unique and extraordinary things that happen in the book of Acts. And we need to be careful not to assume that those extraordinary things are still happening in the church today. Now, we don't have time to get into a full orb discussion of the modern charismatic controversy. We will get into a little bit of charismatic history when we get to next semester, when we finally make it to the 20th century since the modern Pentecostal movement started allegedly on January 1st, 1901, when a woman in Topeka, Kansas spoke in tongues. Uh, we will get into a little bit of that, but one of the presuppositions that undergirds the modern Pentecostal and then from there the modern charismatic and from there the modern third wave movements is this idea that what happened in the book of Acts is normative and therefore ought to be expected for all of church history. And I think there are very good reasons, which we'll get into more detail next semester when we talk about the charismatic movement, but there are very good reasons to see the book of Acts not as normative, but rather simply as historical narrative and as that which records an extraordinary period of time at the beginning of the church age. Now, why is it so important for there to be this extraordinary display of the Spirit's power it is because God is doing something brand new in salvation history. Now, salvation, the gospel, has not changed. Salvation is always by faith alone. In the Old Testament, it is by faith. In the New Testament, it is by faith. And yet, for the first time in salvation history, God is working in such a way as to include Gentiles into his people into his kingdom purposes on equal footing with ethnic Jews. This is a massive transition. For the 
1,500 years before this, going back to the time of Moses and the Exodus, God has been working only through the nation of Israel. And now, in the church age, God will be working in such a way as to incorporate Jew and Gentile into his family on equal footing in the church. This is something new. It requires significant and undeniable authentication, which is why God gives signs, signs to Christ as the Messiah, signs to Christ's successors, the apostles, in order to prove, to demonstrate, to validate that the gospel they were preaching was indeed the truth. Ephesians 2.20, which I see as the pivotal passage in the charismatic controversy, in terms of the timing of the gifts, Ephesians 2.20 indicates that those signs were necessary for the age of the apostles and the prophets for the foundation of the church. Once that foundation was laid, those signed gifts are no longer necessary. Okay, so we could get into a, a very long discussion about that issue. Uh, if you're really interested in charismatic theology, I'll be teaching a class on it next spring, and we'll get into all of those details. But for now, I think it's sufficient simply to establish the fact at the very beginning that the book of Acts records a unique period of time at the beginning of the church's history. Yeah, David. Yeah, the class that I teach is a little bit of both because the history of the modern charismatic movement is really, really important to understanding the theology that undergirds the modern charismatic movement. But maybe I can just simplify the issue for you uh, in 30 seconds or less. When we look at the book of Acts, when we see the apostles speaking in tongues, they are speaking authentic human foreign languages which they did not learn. It's a miracle. When they prophesy, like Agabus prophesies in uh, Acts 11, and then he prophesies again a little bit later, when his prophecies come, they come with the full authority of the Holy Spirit. They are infallible and they are authoritative. When Peter and John and the other apostles heal people in the book of Acts, those healings, like Christ's healings in the Gospels, are instantaneous, undeniable, and inexplicable, except for the miraculous. So the book of Acts sets forth for us sign gifts that are undeniable miracles. If we fast forward to the modern charismatic movement, the modern charismatic movement has redefined the gift of tongues, as a private prayer language that consists of an irrational speech which does not correspond to any known human foreign language. They have redefined prophecy as that which is often inaccurate, fallible, and non-binding. And they have redefined healings in one of two ways. There's the Benny Hinn form of healings, which don't work. And then there is the James 5 answers to prayer kind of healings, which are not immediate, not instantaneous, not 100% effective. It's pray for a person and wait to see if God heals them in his time. When you compare what's going on in the modern charismatic movement with what was happening in the book of Acts, there is no comparison. They're using the same terminology, but it's not the same thing. Now you don't have to take the class. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're marching our way then through the book of Acts, this unique foundational period of time in church history where God is establishing something new in the sense that he is now extending his salvation work to Gentiles as Gentiles. Now, the gospel has always gone out to the Gentile nations. Israel was to be a witness to the Gentile nations. But for the first time, Jew and Gentile are incorporated into the church on equal footing. This is the mystery that Paul talks about in Ephesians 2 and 3. For the first eight chapters, we see the gospel going forth to Jerusalem and Judea and then to Samaria in chapter 8. 
We have Philip the evangelist taking the gospel to Samaria. And then we even see the gospel being extended to a Jewish proselyte, the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. So we see the Great Commission being unfolded in the book of Acts. And I really think that's the best way to understand the book of Acts in terms of an outline, is that the Great Commission is being fulfilled in this account. First Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and now the uttermost parts of the earth. I used a PowerPoint on Thursday to kind of help us as we worked our way through the discussion. I think we left off right around here. This is a line drawing of Peter and John healing the lame man in Acts chapter 3. And of course, then Peter preaches a great sermon. Uh, they are arrested. Gamaliel gives his advice. Um, Actually, that's a little bit later, the second time that the apostles are arrested. But we see persecution coming into the church very early on. This leads, of course, in Acts chapter 7 to Stephen being stoned. Uh, one comment here about some of the artwork that I'll be using in PowerPoints over the course of the semester is that especially with the early church leaders and with the apostles themselves, uh, when we're looking at these art pieces, we are looking at someone's medieval interpretation of what happened. We are not looking at actual eyewitness artistic representations. I think you guys understand that. But for example, Stephen did not dress like a Roman Catholic <laughs> priest or a Greek Orthodox priest when he stood before the Sanhedrin. And in all likelihood, he didn't have a shaved top of his head or any of this. So this is a medieval representation of what happened. That's not actually what Stephen looked like. Uh, for that matter, you've got guys in this picture throwing tiny little rocks at Stephen. And I think a more accurate representation is probably something like this. Uh, though, again, this is, again, an artistic imagination, projection of what happened. So take these pictures for what they're worth. They add a little bit of visual interest. They're not necessarily historically accurate. I mentioned on Thursday that as a result of Stephen's stoning, and I think this is why Luke includes this account in the book of Acts, since Stephen represents really the first major wave of persecution. Certainly the apostles had been arrested, they had been beaten and released, but now Stephen has been martyred, and this unleashes a wave of persecution and it's interesting that at the forefront of this wave of persecution in the book of Acts is none other than Saul. And God is using Saul, even as an unbeliever, to spread the gospel because it is the persecution that forces Christians to leave Jerusalem and Judea and to really escape into other parts of the Roman Empire. And when we get to Acts chapter, well, it's Acts chapter 11 at the end, Luke talks about the fact in Acts 11:19 that it was a result of the persecution against Stephen that Christians left and went to places like Cyprus and Cyrene and eventually to Antioch, where then they preached the gospel and Gentiles were starting to get saved. So this is, this is significant the stoning of Stephen, and the persecution that it sparks. And uh, we mentioned that right after this, Philip takes the gospel to Samaria, and we see the Great Commission being fulfilled. Acts chapter 9 brings us to the pivotal change in Saul's life, the Damascus Road experience. When Saul is knocked off of his horse, sees a bright light, and hears the voice of Christ asking Saul why Saul is persecuting him. Saul, why are you persecuting me? There in Acts chapter 9, verse 4. Saul is blinded as a result, and he goes to Damascus, where he meets a man named Ananias. We usually associate Ananias in the book of Acts with Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Well, that's the bad Ananias. 
Acts chapter 9 is the good Ananias. He's the one who meets with Saul and who encourages Saul. Now, you'll notice in Acts chapter 9, verse 23, it says there that when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted to, together to do away with Saul. That's Acts chapter 9, verse 23. That when many days had elapsed actually encompasses a significant period of time, at least three years, maybe four years worth of time. And we know that from Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul talks about the fact that after he was converted, he went into the Arabian wilderness and we believe that it was while he was in the Arabian wilderness that he was actually discipled personally by the Lord Jesus since in act in Galatians chapter 1 verses 15 and 16 it talks about how he was in communion with Christ during those 3 years in Arabia after 3 years in Arabia he went back to Damascus according to Galatians 1:17 and then in Galatians 1.18, he made a secret trip to Jerusalem. During that secret trip to Jerusalem, he met only with Peter and with James. After that, he went back to Damascus. And it is then that Luke picks up the story in Acts 9.23. So there has been a significant period of time between Acts 9.22 and Acts 9.23, and Galatians 1 helps us fill in some of the biographical gaps there for the Apostle Paul. Uh, there is in Damascus, uh, Damascus right now is not a place you want to visit, but there is in Damascus a traditional site that has been turned into a church that... Um, at least according to tradition, is the house of Ananias. And uh, there is a church that still meets in the house of Ananias there in Damascus. All right. After uh, those bullet points just summarize the things that I just said, in case you were wondering why I went by them so quickly. Uh, after Saul returns to Damascus, and Luke picks up the record here in Acts 9.23, you have the Jews, the Jewish leaders in particular, in Damascus plotting to kill Saul. And they were certainly incensed by the fact that their lead prosecutor had suddenly become the star witness for the defense. And Saul, who had persecuted the church, was now preaching Christ more fervently than anyone else, and the Jewish leaders determined that he needed to be put to death. And of course, the famous Bible story, famous Sunday school classic of Saul being let over the edge of the wall in a basket, and he escaped from Damascus, and from there he came to Jerusalem. This is in verse 26 of Acts chapter 9. Even though it's been roughly four years since Paul was converted. You still have the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem afraid of him. And in verse 27, we have Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who comes alongside of Saul and brings him to the apostles and really serves as a liaison in terms of including Saul in the church there in Jerusalem. Here's a picture of the gate where, according to tradition, Paul escaped from Damascus, and that gate is still there in Damascus. All right, a map showing just uh, some of the key places in Paul's early life. You have him growing up in Tarsus, which is way up in the north there. And then spending time, of course, in Jerusalem as an unsaved man, going all the way up to Damascus, 
then spending three years in the Arabian wilderness, back to Damascus, a secret trip to Jerusalem, then back to Damascus again, persecuted by the Jewish religious leaders, escapes from Damascus, comes to Jerusalem, and that's where Barnabas really embraces him. It's from Jerusalem that Paul will go to Caesarea, and then back to Tarsus before he will join Barnabas in Antioch. Now, one of the things that Luke brings out in Acts chapter 9, in verses really 26 all the way to 30, is that everywhere that Paul went, and this is from the very beginnings of his Christian life, everywhere that Paul went, trouble and persecution and opposition followed him. And I think it's interesting even how Luke brings this out in Acts chapter 9, that you have in verse 29, Paul was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic or Greek Jews, would have been those of the sect of the Sadducees. But they were attempting to put him to death, verse 30, but when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and and kind of got him out of town. And then verse 31, as soon as Saul leaves, Luke says this, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So when Saul first enters the picture, he's persecuting the church so the church doesn't have peace. Once Paul gets saved, he's preaching so vigorously that he's inciting the wrath of the Jewish religious leaders, the church doesn't have any peace. And when Saul finally leaves and goes to Caesarea, then everything quiets down for a little while. Luke, of course, is the traveling companion of Paul, saved under Paul's ministry, Paul's dear friend. But you can't help but thinking that maybe in even recording this, that Luke is bringing out the fact that turmoil seems to travel with Paul. Uh, It's significant that Paul goes to Caesarea. It's significant for a couple reasons. Philip the evangelist had already spent some time in Caesarea, according to Acts 8.40. And a little bit later in Acts, we'll see that Philip seems to have settled in Caesarea. And Saul also goes to Caesarea. And you know, given Saul's evangelistic fervor, that he was preaching the gospel everywhere that he went. So he goes to Caesarea and he is preaching the gospel there. That's significant because in the very next chapter, Acts chapter 10, Peter is going to be called by the Holy Spirit to Caesarea where he is going to witness the conversion of the first Gentile convert, a man named Cornelius. So I don't think it's any accident. I know it's not an accident because God's sovereign, but I don't think it's any coincidence that Cornelius is from Caesarea since the gospel witness had already been there through Philip and also through Paul, who had subsequently then gone on to Tarsus before Peter arrived in Caesarea. But Acts chapter 10 is this major turning point even within the book of Acts because up to this point, everyone who has been saved has been connected in some way to Judaism. You have the Jews on the day of Pentecost who are saved. You have the Samaritans who admittedly are not full-blooded Jews, but still have Jewish blood in them who are converted in Acts chapter 8. You have a Jewish proselyte in the Ethiopian eunuch who is converted. But now for the first time, we are going to have an uncircumcised Gentile. Now he's a God-fearing Gentile but we're going to have an uncircumcised Gentile who is brought into the church. And this is going to be confirmed in Acts chapter 10 by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon Cornelius and those in his household, which, by the way, does not in any way imply infant baptism. Just get that out of the way. And uh, Cornelius and his family come to faith in Christ. They are saved, and they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit... In the same way, Peter says in Acts chapter 11, as the apostles did on the day of Pentecost. And so in Acts 11, Peter goes back and 
it's, he goes back to the Jerusalem Council and he gives a report to the Jewish believers there who are absolutely shocked that a Gentile would be incorporated into the people of God on equal footing with Jews. And he reports that what happened on the day of Pentecost was the same thing that happened for Cornelius. So we have Cornelius saved. Now this would have taken place sometime after A.D. 37, given the chronological data that we have, and I've spelled that out a little bit more in the notes themselves, some specific uh, archaeological data with regard to the timing of Paul's escape from Damascus. What that means is that the full incorporation of Gentiles into the church took the better part of a decade from the day of Pentecost. And I think that's important for us to understand that this was a major transition, again, in what God is doing in the world. It wasn't like the day of Pentecost and suddenly there were Gentiles everywhere in the church. This was a process, and it was a process that for the Jewish Christians was something that really took time to sink in because their entire lives and for 1,500 years of their nation's history, in order to be right with God, you needed to become a Jew. And uh, now, for the first time, Gentiles are being included. This is a major, major shift. This is important to have Peter uh, witnessing the conversion of Cornelius because Peter provides apostolic authentication that what happened was indeed uh, what he said happened. And so we have really uh, the highest form of authority, Christ's own apostle, one of Christ's apostles bearing eyewitness testimony to what took place. And the result is that the Jews in Jerusalem, verse 18 of chapter 11, when they hear this, they stopped their objections, they glorified God, and they say, well, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. And really, Acts 10 and 11 provide the catalyst in terms of God's perfect plan, provide the catalyst for explaining how Christianity goes from being a predominantly Jewish religion to being a predominantly Gentile religion. The rest of the book then is going to focus on um, the gospel being taken to the uttermost parts of the world, primarily through the missionary work of the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 11 there at the end, verses 19 all the way through verse 30, Luke is going to tell us about these Gentile converts up north in Antioch who had been converted through the witness and testimony of Christian Jews who had fled from Jerusalem and Judea due to the persecution that was incited by Saul. And ironically, Saul incites the persecution, which domino effect leads to the conversion of these Gentiles in Antioch, and then Saul's going to be called to be one of their first pastors. And uh, it's pretty amazing to consider the fact that there were probably in the church at Antioch people who had fled from Jerusalem because of Saul, who then later were pastored by the guy they ran away from. Saul, of course, is in Tarsus at this time, but when the apostles... After Cornelius, which sets the precedent, when the apostles hear that there are Gentiles coming to faith in Christ and being baptized up in Antioch, they send Barnabas to be the first lead pastor of a predominantly Gentile church. So the first Gentile church is the church in Antioch, and the first pastor of this Gentile church is Barnabas the son of encouragement. According to Acts chapter 11, verse 21 and 22, we have the record of those conversions. Barnabas is sent in verse 22 of Acts 11. Verse 23, he preaches. And verse 25, considerable numbers are being brought to faith in the Lord. 
and he's there for maybe a year or so when he leaves to go find that zealous evangelist whom he had met years earlier in Jerusalem. He goes to Tarsus to find Saul and to bring Saul back to Antioch to be the co-pastor of the church in Antioch. Barnabas and Saul then together have a fruitful ministry among the Gentile believers in Antioch. Now, Antioch is a significant city in the Roman Empire. Today, it's part of Turkey. It's just north of the Syrian border on the Mediterranean coast. But Antioch at this time was much more prominent and important than it is even today. Historians estimate that perhaps as many as half a million people lived in Antioch and that it would have been the third largest city in the Roman Empire at the time. Antioch will become one of the most important cities in church history. When we study the history of Christianity within the Roman Empire, it tends to be cities that become centers not only of political or economic power or centers of academic influence, but it is cities that become centers of religious and Christian influence as well. There will be cities like Rome, cities like Alexandria, Egypt, cities like Constantinople, which doesn't even exist at this point, cities like Jerusalem, and cities like Antioch will become the most important cities within Roman Christianity as we move into church history. But it's pretty cool. The first Gentile church is this church in Antioch, and this church becomes a missionary church because they are concerned for the Gentile uh, pagans throughout all of the Roman Empire, and pretty soon they're going to send missionaries out to those churches. All right, so Barnabas goes to Tarsus, he finds Saul, and probably around A.D. 45, 15 years now after the day of Pentecost, Saul ministers with Barnabas for an entire year in Antioch and then raises support along with Barnabas in order to travel south to Jerusalem. Now the text in Acts says they go up to Jerusalem, but that's because geographically it's uphill and in scripture everyone goes up to Jerusalem. So don't think of up in terms of north, think of up in terms of uphill. They travel south, which is uphill, to Jerusalem in order to meet the needs of the saints in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is experiencing a famine during this time period. Now we know from archaeological and historical uh, factors, we know that that famine took place in the mid-40s, and so that helps us date the timing of when these events took place in the book of Acts. So around A.D. 46, Saul and Barnabas bring relief to the church in Jerusalem, and then they return to Antioch before departing on their first missionary journey. Luke interrupts the history about Paul to tell us about what was happening in Jerusalem. We have the martyrdom of James. This is James, the brother of John, James, the son of Zebedee not James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, remains as the head of the Jerusalem council and as an elder and apostle there in Jerusalem. But James, the son of Zebedee, is martyred. Peter is also imprisoned. And of course, you know the account of Peter's release from prison. Then we have the death of Herod in 1220. And in 1225, we pick up the story again with Barnabas and Saul, who return from Jerusalem after fulfilling their mission. And they take along with them a young man named Mark. He was Barnabas's cousin or nephew. And his mother owned a home in Jerusalem that was one of the meeting places for the Jerusalem church. And Mark, of course, is the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark. A lot more that we could say about any of these individuals. The story of Mark is a really, really cool one. 
And uh, if you have the opportunity to pick up Dr. MacArthur's new book called 12 Unlikely Heroes, there's a great chapter that details the life and impact of John Mark. It's, uh, it's worth the read. In Acts chapter 13, then, we begin these missionary journeys. And you're familiar with the missionary journeys because you have maps in the back of your Bible. And sometimes, probably when you were younger and you got a little bit wearisome in the midst of long sermons, you would flip to the maps and wonder what those maps were doing in the back of your Bible. Well, the maps detail for us the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And uh, we're going to talk through these a little bit because I want to make these missionary journeys come alive to you uh, so that you don't just think of them as maps, but you think of them as uh, ministry that really took place in time and space through the influence of Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey and then Paul and Silas on the second and third missionary journeys. In chapter 13, we see that the church of Antioch has a number of prophets and teachers, we can assume from this that Paul and Barnabas have been working at establishing a leadership structure in the church of Antioch, which then frees them up to go on and plant churches in other places throughout the Roman Empire. I don't think that's too much of a stretch. We have the leaders named there in chapter 13. And we see that Paul and Barnabas' pattern when they go to plant churches is to put in place leadership structures so that those churches can continue to thrive even in their absence. And I think there's a lesson for us in missionary work, in church planting, that you focus on strong church leadership, you raise up that leadership, and the health of the church is, is dependent on the leadership that is raised up and established. It's part of the reason I love what our church here, Grace Community, does with the uh, Master's academies around the world is it's all about leadership training, and I think you see that mirrored and patterned even in the examples of Paul and the other early missionaries. Chapter 13 and 14 of Acts detail this first missionary journey, and they travel first to Cyprus, and it's there at Cyprus where Saul is no longer called Saul but takes up the name Paul which was his Greek name, Saul was his Jewish name, and it's likely that uh, as he went to minister within a predominantly Greek and Gentile context, that Paul began to use his Greek name more often than his Jewish name. It's also possible that because of the persecution that Saul had inflicted on the church, that he saw his Jewish name as even a stumbling block to believers who might still be afraid of him in the places that he visited. So we have him changing his name to Paul, or not changing his name, but using his Greek name, and he's going to be referred to as Paul throughout the rest of the book of Acts. You have them leaving Cyprus. They encounter, of course, a false prophet there on Cyprus, and um, it proves to be too much for John Mark. John Mark actually abandons the missions trip at that point, goes back home to Jerusalem. But of course, John Mark is later recovered by the Apostle Paul and becomes useful to him. And uh, that's part of the great story that Dr. MacArthur details in, in the book, 12 Unlikely Heroes. Paul travels then to uh, Perga and then to Antioch of Pisidia. Pisidian Antioch, which is different than Syrian Antioch. And you need to be careful not to confuse those. In the book of Galatians, in chapter 3, Paul talks about the fact that when he arrived in Perga, he was struck with some sort of illness. And we think, based on the description in Galatians, that it was some illness that affected his eyesight temporarily, because he tells the Galatians, if you could have, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. And so there, there seems to have been some sort of physical sickness that he encountered, Luke does not detail that here, but Paul does give us that information in the book of Galatians. Paul goes to Perga and Antioch and then these other cities, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. In Acts chapter 13, verses 40, all the way to uh, verse 47, well, it actually starts earlier than that. It starts in verse... Um, 
starts in verse 16 and goes all the way to verse 47. We have one of Paul's longest evangelistic sermons, even though the Acts 17 sermon on Mars Hill is probably more famous. Uh, the Acts 13 sermon is actually longer and uh, incorporates or I think illustrates the way that the Apostle Paul addressed a crowd of predominantly Jewish people. These would have been Jews who had been scattered throughout the entire Roman Empire. Paul, when he went to a city, went first into the synagogue, ministered to the Jews because he had a starting point of the Old Testament. And that's, in fact, where he starts here in Acts chapter 13 with the Old Testament. When it's a predominantly Gentile pagan audience, Paul starts with creation as he does in Acts 17. So you see that Paul's starting point in his evangelistic uh, presentations sometimes differs a little bit, even though the content of his message always gets to Christ, the crucifixion, and the resurrection as the heart of his gospel presentation. But in Acts chapter 13, there's an important point here. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. You said he started, when he went to Israel, he started at how? He started with the Gentiles using creation and uh, when he spoke to Madonna, the Jewish congregation, it's in he started with the Old Testament. So, um, so you have him, his normal pattern is to go into the synagogue of a city and to reason with the Jews of the city first. And oftentimes many of those Jews will become Christians and he would plant a church and then that church's influence would then incorporate Gentile pagans into the church. And uh, so you have him starting with the Old Testament and reasoning from the Old Testament scriptures to show that Jesus is the Christ. And so you have that in Acts chapter 13, uh, starting in verse 16 and going all the way through, I, I was mistaken earlier, going all the way through verse 41. But what I wanted to show you is, um, let me see, in verse 38, this is where Paul really gets to the crux of the matter in Acts chapter 13. It says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and that through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. And then, there, and then he goes on to, to finish a sermon with a quote from the Old Testament. But this is a massive paradigm shift, again, for a Jewish audience to hear that salvation is through Christ. Salvation is not through keeping the law of Moses. Now, salvation was never through keeping the law of Moses in an external sense. Uh, the legalism that had come to characterize first century Judaism had turned the law of Moses into something it was never intended to be. But this is a significant point in Paul's message that the law of Moses is no longer binding on Christians in the church age and that forgiveness for sins comes through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm drawing attention to that because this is going to become a point of controversy pretty soon here in early church history. Now, Paul goes on. He preached that sermon uh, while he was in Antioch of Pisidia. He goes on from there to Iconium and then to Lystra. It's, of course, in Lystra that he is stoned and left for dead. And then just love how in chapter 14, as soon as he regains his senses, he just gets up and goes right back into the city. Uh, he goes on from there to Derby. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to show you this map is because especially in, well, really in all of these cities, but in Iconium and Lystra and Derby, Paul and Barnabas encounter severe persecution. I mean, getting dragged outside of the city gates and stoned and left for dead, I would classify as severe persecution. But you'll notice on the map that when they get to Derby, they don't go on to Tarsus and then back to Antioch. Like geographically speaking, and especially since Paul was from Tarsus, that would be the simplest and most efficient way to get back home. 
You just stay on the road from Derby. You go to Tarsus. You hang out with Paul's extended family for a little bit. I'm making that part up, obviously. And then you travel back to Antioch. And we know that there was roads connecting those places because Paul, in future missionary journeys, did take those roads going from Antioch through Tarsus up to Derby. But there's a, an interesting point in uh, Acts chapter 14 that in verse 21, this is right after they were in Derby, after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, and then they returned to Iconium, and then they returned to Antioch. They are intentionally backtracking. Why? Because, verse 22, they are strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God, verse 23, when they had appointed elders in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So they go through wave one, preaching the gospel, and come back wave two, encouraging the saints and establishing leadership in those local churches. So the, the reason the first missionary journey has this kind of tail hanging on it is because Paul and Barnabas actually went through all those cities not once, but twice. And then they came back to Antioch. Now, at the end of chapter 14... Verse 27, when they'd arrived back at Antioch and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. And this was a period of rejoicing because there were churches in the Gentile world that were now being planted from the first Gentile church, the church at Antioch. Now, all of that is some background to set the stage for Acts chapter 15, which is perhaps one of the most important chapters in the book of Acts. This is the account of the Jerusalem Council, which took place around 49 AD. The Jerusalem Council is technically speaking the first church council. Now we're going to have a lot of church councils that we're going to talk about in this class, but this is the first church council council, and the issue at stake at this church council is nothing less than the heart of the gospel itself. So in chapter 15, verse 1, some men came down from Judea, that's downhill, they went north, and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now Paul, in his gospel presentation, had just told the the Jews of Pisidian Antioch, all you need to do is trust in Christ. You no longer need to keep the law of Moses. And now we have Judaizers, as we'll come to call them, coming from Jerusalem saying, no, you must be circumcised in order to be saved. And then verse 5, obviously this made Paul and Barnabas upset, so they traveled to Jerusalem. Verse 4, when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders reported all that God had done. But verse 5, some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So the question here in Acts chapter 15 is, is the gospel by faith alone by grace alone, in Christ alone, that's the gospel that Paul had just preached on his first missionary journey, or is the gospel by faith plus circumcision plus observing the law of Moses? In other words, is it by faith plus works, or is it by faith alone? That really is the essence of the controversy here in Acts chapter 15. This, by the way, will be the essence of controversy throughout all of church history. This was the essence of the controversy in the Reformation. It is still a controversy in the church. Galatians chapter 2. In fact, let's turn there for just a moment. Galatians chapter 2. Paul gives 
some additional information about what was going on in Acts chapter 15. And uh, he says, after an interval of 14 years, this is in addition to the three years he spent in Arabia, so 17 years after his conversion, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas. I, he says, it was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. In other words, I told them, this is the gospel that I'm preaching. He says, I did so in private at first to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So they didn't make this Gentile convert Titus uh, undergo circumcision. But it was because of the false brethren, verse 4, secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage specifically bondage to the Mosaic law. Verse 5, we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, and particularly the leaders of the Jerusalem council, he says, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. In other words, they didn't add any stipulations on the gospel I had been preaching. On the contrary, verse 7, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter to the circumcised, for God who effectually worked for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked for me to the Gentiles, recognized the grace that had been given to me, James and Peter and John, who were reputed to be the pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Paul is explaining, and in the context of this letter will make more sense in a moment, but Paul is explaining to his readers that at the Jerusalem council, his gospel, the gospel he had been preaching, was attacked by false brethren, and the apostles investigated the matter, and they validated, authenticated, and affirmed that Paul's gospel was indeed the true gospel. Well, that's the story that is also told here in Acts chapter 15 from Luke's perspective, giving a little bit more of the historical data. Verse 6 of Acts chapter 15, the apostles and elders came together to look into the matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, this is a very, very important section here in the book of Acts dealing with sola fide, which is a Reformation way of saying salvation is by faith alone. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Look at what Peter says in Acts 15, verse 7. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's a reference to Acts 10 and Cornelius. Peter was the one who preached to Cornelius. Cornelius was the first Gentile convert. Verse 8, and God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. So the Holy Spirit himself verified that the true gospel was preached and received by the Gentiles. Verse 9, he made no distinction between us and them. Jews and Gentiles are on equal footing in the church. Cleansing their hearts by faith. There it is cleansing their hearts by faith. Verse 10, now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? So why would you add works, Peter asks? Why would you add the works of the law in this specific case? But why would you add works to the gospel when the Holy Spirit himself had cleansed their hearts by faith? And then verse 11, but we believe that we are saved through grace, through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are also. So there you have at the Jerusalem council, Peter himself affirming that the gospel of faith alone, grace alone, that Peter had, that Paul, excuse me, had been preaching on this first missionary journey was in fact the true gospel. And the gospel of faith plus circumcision or faith plus circumcision plus the commandments of the law, that that kind of faith was a false 
gospel. Now, James, the brother, the half-brother of Jesus, is going to uh, affirm what Peter has just said. James is going to ask that Gentile Christians observe a few things just to be sensitive to their fellow Jewish believers. Among those are going to be certain dietary restrictions. Uh, He's going to say in verse 29 that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood. Paul is going to pick up on that in 1 Corinthians 8 and 9 and in Romans 14 and 15 when he tells his primarily Gentile congregations, hey, be sensitive to your Jewish weaker brothers whose consciences are more strict than your own and don't eat food offered to idols if it's going to cause a fellow brother to stumble. Okay, that's all coming out of the decision that was reached at the Jerusalem Council. But the important thing for our class is to establish the fact here at the first council in church history, a defense of the true gospel, which is a gospel by faith, not a gospel by faith plus works. And when we get to the Reformation, for example, we're going to see that the Catholic Church had really become a 16th century version of the Judaizers because they had added to faith things like baptism, which they actually say is the New Testament equivalent to circumcision, and the keeping of the Ten Commandments, which are, of course, the heart and summary of the Mosaic Law. So the Catholic Church became what the Judaizers were, and, well, we'll we'll get there to the Reformation. Now, Paul goes, and Barnabas, they go back to Antioch, But there are still Judaizers who are going, for the rest of Paul's ministry, are going to try and undermine the gospel of faith alone, grace alone, a gospel apart from works. They're going to try and undermine that gospel by teaching Christians that they must essentially become Jewish, circumcised law keepers in order to be saved. Some of those Judaizers show up in these churches. I'm pointing at my computer screen. I should be pointing at what you guys are looking at. And uh, when Paul hears that there are people in the churches where he just sacrificed almost his life in order to bring them the gospel, when he hears that there are people in those churches who are threatening the gospel that he preached by introducing the works of the law, he writes a letter. And that letter is the book of Galatians. And the letter to the Galatians starts out, because these are the churches of southern Galatia, this letter to the Galatians starts out by asking, how in the world could you so quickly turn to that which is not a true gospel? And even if an angel from heaven were to come and preach that gospel, he would be accursed. You say, wow, that's that's pretty strong, Paul. Well, but imagine, you go on a two-year missions trip. I'm not sure it was quite two years, but you go on a lengthy missions trip where you're almost killed planting churches, and you come home, and you hear that Mormons have shown up. What are you going to do? You're going to write a letter or get on a plane or call or something. You're not just going to sit back and say, well, oops. No, you're going to be emotionally invested in the spiritual well-being of those churches. And so the emotion that's represented in the book of Galatians is a reflection of the controversy that took place in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council and of the sacrifice that Paul and Barnabas made on their first missionary journey. Understanding the historical connections in Acts will help you preach the book of Galatians in a way that makes more sense and in a way that really fuels the passion in your own preaching in a way that uh, you wouldn't be able to do if you were unaware of that context. All right, we've spent a good bit of time talking about the Jerusalem Council. That's okay. The great thing about teaching a class like this is if we get behind schedule, we get behind schedule. Okay, so the PowerPoint slides now are going to catch up with uh, what I've been saying, but you can see here that Paul goes to these churches. Now, on the second missionary journey, 
Paul's intent is not to go to new places. Paul's intent is to go back to the very same churches he had just visited. Not only does he write them a letter because he's so concerned about their spiritual well-being, he is going to personally go visit each of those congregations again. Uh, there is the division over John Mark. We don't have time to get into that. Uh, Timothy joins Paul and Silas, and uh, they go back to the very same churches. They go back to Derby and back to Lystra and back to Iconium. And it is while they are visiting those churches from the first missionary journey that God gives Paul the famous Macedonian vision, the Macedonian call, and it is only then that Paul determines to go to Macedonia. And then he goes to Philippi. They're kicked out of Philippi. He goes to Thessalonica, kicked out of Thessalonica. He goes to Berea and, of course, makes the statement that the Bereans were more noble because they searched the scriptures to see if the things that Paul was saying were true. He goes then to Athens. In Athens, he starts in the synagogue, of course, but as he spends time in Athens, he is, his spirit is... Uh, provoked within him at all of the idols in the city. And he goes and preaches that great message on Mars Hill uh, about who the unknown God in the city really is. And uh, from there then goes to Corinth and he will spend a considerable amount of time in Corinth. Now, as he travels, he is writing letters. So he writes letters to the Philippians. He writes letter. well, the letter to the Philippians actually comes a little bit later. It comes during his uh, first Roman imprisonment. But he writes letters to the Thessalonians. Galatians is Paul's first epistle. First Thessalonians is Paul's second epistle. Uh, I should probably make a note of the fact that I've given you a list in your notes of the order in which the New Testament books were completed. Uh, James was probably completed first. Uh, Matthew completed shortly thereafter. Uh, Galatians was Paul's first epistle. First Thessalonians was his second epistle. Understanding the chrono uh, chronological flow of when the epistles was written is a helpful tool in your own understanding of the context of those epistles when you preach and teach them. If you're wondering how we got the order in our New Testament that we have, which is not chronological, but canonical, it is because it was arranged categorically, starting with the history books, the four histories of Jesus Christ, and then the history of the church. And then it was Paul's epistles, starting with the longest and going to the shortest. So they are arranged in terms of length in the New Testament. And then it's the general epistles, of course, followed by the apocalypse of the Apostle John. Uh, so the order of the books in your New Testament is not the order in which they were written. And then finally, a return to Syrian Antioch. And so you can see here on this map how he starts by going back to Derby and Iconium and Lystra and Antioch in uh, Pisidia, and then from there heads all the way over to Macedonia in modern day Greece. All right, just some pictures here of different places, the Areopagus there, and so on. Uh, starting halfway through Acts. Chapter 18 is actually all the way to verse 23 of Acts 18. Paul embarks on a third missionary journey. And this missionary journey, again, is Paul's way of going back to the same churches he's already been part of. Uh, I think it's helpful. Sometimes people see the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and they think that it legitimizes a kind of itinerant evangelist approach to ministry where you just go around to certain cities uh, preaching crusades or those kinds of things and then leave and never do any kind of follow-up. That is not at all Paul's approach. 
Paul goes to these cities, plants churches, stays as long as he can given the persecution in order to make sure that leadership is developed in those churches. And then Paul, of course, he prays for the churches constantly. We know that from 2 Corinthians 11. But Paul also sends letters to these churches. He sends emissaries to these churches. And he himself follows up personally with visits to these churches whenever it is possible for him to do so. So I think we need to not think of Paul as somebody who came into town and left never to return, but rather as someone who planted something that he was constantly following up on as much as he was able to do at a time period when the technology didn't allow him to have quite the constant access that we have today. Um, one other note, uh, it was during Paul's... Well, let me back out of this just for a moment. And uh, here's what I was talking about in terms of the order of the books. It was during the second missionary journey that Paul wrote both First and Second Thessalonians and then also First and Second Corinthians. I wanted to make just one point about Second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11 is where Paul, in the whole book, he's defending his apostleship. But in Second Corinthians 11, Paul talks about all of the persecutions that he had faced about how he's been shipwrecked, how he's been beaten, how he's been left for dead, all, that whole litany of things that Paul has endured. I just want to make this point. Paul wrote that chapter in the middle of his second, or towards the end, of his second missionary journey. So that long list of persecutions, that only encompasses the first half of Paul's missionary life. The shipwreck that he talks about there in 2 Corinthians 11 is not the same shipwreck as Luke records at the end of the book of Acts. Okay, so when you read 2 Corinthians 11, that's only the first part of Paul's missionary life. That's not the totality of Paul's missionary life. All right. Again, just trying to help you see how the history gives you exegetical insights into the text. All right back here at the third missionary journey. We have the introduction of Apollos. We have the disciples of John the Baptist in Acts 19. They also received the Holy Spirit in the same way as Cornelius had and as the apostles had on the day of Pentecost. And then various places in Macedonia and in Greece, he is retracing his steps, visiting the same churches he had already been at in the second missionary journey. It is there that he is convinced by the Holy Spirit that he needs to go to Jerusalem, even though it is also revealed to him through the Holy Spirit that once he gets there, he's going to be arrested. But Paul is confident that his road to Rome, which is where he ultimately wants to go, that that road goes through Jerusalem. And so he travels back. He meets with the Ephesian elders at Miletus for that tearful goodbye, the great, great uh, message of encouragement to the leaders of the Ephesian church there in Acts chapter 20. And then he arrives in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21, verse 15. And so the third missionary journey, again, Lystra and Iconium and Derby as well, since they were uh, locations right along that same route, Philippi, Thessalonica, Nica, Corinth, Ephesus, and finally back to Jerusalem. So just reiterating the fact that Paul retraced his steps a lot. And that's because he was concerned to make sure that what he had planted actually flourished. As he says in Galatians, that he had not run in vain. All right, picture of Corinth there and the theater in Ephesus, and of course it's while Paul is in Ephesus on this third missionary journey that he gets the whole city in an uproar because he's ruining the idol trade, because people aren't buying idols anymore because they're no longer idolaters. And uh, this leads us then to Paul's arrest in Jerusalem in uh, 56 A.D. 